So everyone now knows what adjacency matrix in a graph is, right? So let's try and see what, what the role of adjacency matrix is. So, so let's say I have a graph uh, which looks something like this. So it's a directed graph. You can for now assume that the edge weights are simply one. So Here. So first of all, is this graph strongly connected? No, right? So not strongly connected. Okay. So how? So what does the adjacency matrix for this graph looks like? Are there any self loops? So this. Diagonal entries are going to be all zeros. So there are only outgoing edges, let's say from one, there are only outgoing edges to two and three, right? So, so that means uh, X can, one can broadcast to two and three, but uh, cannot receive any message from anyone else. So it can broadcast to two and three. So this is the entry for the, likewise, uh, you have for two, uh, it can broadcast to four. And you have zeros here. For three, it can broadcast to two and four. And four, it cannot broadcast to anyone. So all the entries are going to be. And as I said, in case of directed graphs, it's possible that the adjacency matrix is not symmetric. And that's what you see, right? So not symmetric. Okay. So when I do a times, let's say x, x being x1, x2, x3, x4. So what is the output of this? So that would be 0 for the first entry because 1 is not going to be getting any information from anyone, right? Uh, what about 2? So x1 plus x3, this is going to be x1 and this is x2 plus x3. So let's let's look at what happens when we use a square. So what is a square? Uh, you can do the math. It turns out that a square is simply okay. So this is your a square. Now if I do a square times x. What does this look, look, look like? So the first entry is again going to be 0. The second entry is x1, 0 and 2x1 plus x3. So what are, so I mean this makes sense because you can see that 2 is going to be receiving information from uh, let us say here. So 2 is going to be receiving, in, receiving information from 1 and 3 and that is that is because of this, right? This edge and then this particular edge, right? So you have x1 and x3 showing up. Likewise, 4 is going to be receiving information from 2 and 3 and that is why you have x2 and x3 showing up. Why do you have x1 showing up here? Or for that matter, uh, x1 and x3 showing up here? So if I look at the second one, right, 2. So 2, yeah, so in this case we have x1 showing up and actually there is a 2 hop information flow from 1 to 2, right. And if I look at the x4, there is also a 2 hop information flow from here and 2 hop information flow from here, okay. So that means if I do uh, a to the k times x. So what I am essentially doing is I am aggregating information from my k hop neighbors or I am receiving information from my k hop neighbors, right? And that is in fact how the information propagates in a graph. So the first time I do uh, a times x, I, x, I basically receive information from my uh, immediate neighbors. But in that process, the neighbors would have also received information from their, their, their neighbors, right? So the next time when I aggregate information from my neighbors, I am going to be receiving the information that my neighbors have aggregated from others, right? 
So essentially getting information from my two hop neighbors, N3 hop neighbors and so on. So that's how their information flows in, in a graph. And that's why when you have a line graph, where you, the, inf for the information to propagate from, let's say the first no node to the end node, that's going to take at least n minus one steps because that's, that's the amount of time it's going to take to propagate information from one end to another, right? But then, uh, so if, if you guys are aware of something called graph convolutional neural networks, or if you are aware of neural networks, I mean like, are you guys aware of neural networks in general or convolutional neural networks? So convolutional neural network is that you aggregate information from your neighbors. So think of this particular op application as information aggregation with, with your one hop neighbors, two hop neighbors, so every layer, in fact, A to the K, when you say A to the K X, that means there are K such layers. Every layer is aggregating information from one hop neighbors, two hop neighbors, three hop neighbors and so on. And in between you introduce some, some level of non-linearity and that's how you make any predictions on graphs, if you have graph structured data, okay. So that is the idea. All right. So this brings us, brings us to an important topic in the context of uh, distributed optimization, which is consensus. And by definition, basically it uh, amounts to all nodes converging to a common value. Okay. So consensus just talks about every node eventually converging to the same common value. That common value can be anything. I mean you can like let's say all nodes can eventually converge to zero being, but that may not be very useful information. So sometimes not, it's not just the consensus part that we are interested in, but we are also interested in something called average consensus. So the idea is every node can, so this is consensus. So every node converges to a common value, so that is there. But that common value happens to be uh, average of all initial values. So, so essentially, uh, if you have x1, x2, x3, and x4 as the value that every node uh, possesses, so and if there are n such nodes, so you want consensus algorithm to essentially arrive at this particular common value. So this is called average consensus, okay. So you have a belief, someone else may have a belief and you want to arrive at the uh, average of all the beliefs and this is what average consensus is about. So if you remember the example that we considered in the uh, first lecture itself, which was about temperature sensors being installed and every, uh, every, every sensor measuring temperature differently and we want to arrive at the average of all what everyone else is measuring, right? Uh, every, every sensor is measuring and we looked at two different ways to run the consensus algorithm and it so turned out that in one case uh, we were able to arrive at consensus but it wasn't the average consensus that we intended to and by choosing a different, uh, different consensus algorithm or a different weighting scheme, we were, we were able to arrive at the average consensus. So the goal for today's lecture is to, uh, to understand the conditions under which you, so conditions under which consensus is achieved and then conditions under which average consensus is achieved. So you have to have certain conditions, uh, of, if those are satisfied then you can guarantee average consensus and so on. So we are going to study those sufficient conditions. We also mentioned this sufficient conditions. There are other forms of consensus that you may often uh, find in other papers, which are max consensus or min consensus. And as the name suggests, every agent tries to arrive at the max of the values that like every agent in the network possesses, right? So let's say you have a graph which looks something like this. And agent 1 has value T1, T2, T3. 
So the, the objective of max consensus is that every agent is able to arrive at the max of uh, all these values T1, T2. So can you think of an algorithm which does that? So let's say I want to achieve uh, this max consensus in this particular graph. So what kind of algorithm would a very simple algorithm that you can think of that can achieve max consensus or min consensus for that matter. Again agents can only com communicate with their neighbors right. So that's that's one of the constraints that the agents have. It's very simple. Uh, yeah, so every agent just exchanges information and basically replaces its current value with the max of whatever information it has received from its neighbors, right? And that would and just replaces its current state with the max of its current and its neighbor state, right? So agent i, so p i k plus one is simply going to be max of p i k and T J K for every J in the neighborhood set of I, right? So every agent runs this, and how in how many steps uh, is it guaranteed to converge? Yeah, so the diameter of the graph, right? So if diameter of the graph is if D is the graph diameter. then this algorithm converges in in D steps ok. That may not be the case with the uh, with the other can con like uh, asymptotic or the average consensus things that we algorithms that we are going to talk about. There is an I way to let us say obtain average consensus is that you have you run the max consensus I mean you also so essentially you are going to be storing the max value but then at the same time you also have a copy of your current value right. So in the first d step you are going to be uh, storing the max in the second d steps you are going to be storing the second best second largest value and the third largest value and the fourth largest value and so on. So that means in n times d steps right you would have essentially all the values known and then you just take the average of it and that is also uh, going to give you the average consensus. So that is a naive way to go about it and in fact, in fact in, in a finite number of steps you are guaranteed to get the exact average consensus value. But that is not the kind of algorithm that we are going to be looking at because uh, if the graph diameter is large you do not want and if or let us say the graph diameter is also small but if number of agents is very large. You cannot just wait for n times t steps, right? So that is so we would want to avoid this kind of uh, naive way to uh, obtain average consensus or the consensus, okay? So this kind of uh, scheme is often used. Uh, consensus is often used in opinion dynamics, as I mentioned. That uh, that you have certain beliefs. Your neighbors may have certain else, like some other belief and you want to maybe obtain like the consensus of all the beliefs right. Let us say I mean you vote for one particular party, your friend votes for some other party and so on right and you want to see where the average trend is going on. So that this is where the average con consensus or the consensus models really help you with. So in this context uh, you have the I think the French Harare big root dynamics model. opinion dynamics ok and the way it works is that your opinion at time t plus 1 or a step k plus 1 the dynamics essentially is uh, let us say there are n agents in the network a i j where such that Okay, and let 
and AII is nothing but the relative import, like relative importance to its own belief. So what? Let's let's look at this dynamics in sort of more detail. So AIJ potentially can be zero. That means J is not a neighbor of I, right? But if they're non-zero. Then you look at the your neighbor's belief and you essentially do a weighted average of those neighbor's belief and this is your current belief now, okay? And then you sort of run it multiple times. So if you look at the dynamics of this, this is nothing but P of T plus 1 is the is essentially A times P of T, where A is the adjacency matrix of the graph and this time it is going to be a uh, weighted graph, okay? Okay. So, what property does A have here? This matrix A. So, A is row stochastic, right? Okay. So, that means the row sum is 1. So, so A is row stochastic. The row sum is 1. So, does row stochastic A guarantee consensus? So, that is the first question that we are going to look at and the second question is does row stochastic A guarantee average consensus? Okay, so what do you think the answer should be for both these questions? So, P of t plus 1 is essentially a to the t, p of t plus 1 let us say p 0, right? Okay. So, what do we know about a? a is rho stochastic meaning a times if I look at vector of all 1s. This is going to give you a vector of all ones, right? Let us call it, let us say they are n agents. So, this is what it is going to give you. So, that means this vector of all ones is, is an eigenvector of uh, A with eigenvalue also equal to 1. So, as long as uh, as long as the eigenvalues of other eigenvalues of A are strictly smaller than 1 or let us say smaller than 1, okay, or less than or equal to 1, that means your opinions are I mean not diverging, right? As you run this multiple times, as you make A to the t plus 1, as you are exponentiating it further and further. So, I mean think of it in the scalar case, right? Let us say if it is just a scalar case, if it I mean eigenvalue less than 1 or less than or equal to 1 means that you are not uh, sort of diverging the beliefs with every iteration, right? So, then you can hope that uh, in fact this would arrive at consensus. So, with rho stochastic A you can guarantee consensus. So, this is true. But with rho stochastic A you can you need not I mean you would not be able to guarantee average consensus. So, this is not true in general. I mean it is possible, but it is not true in general. Okay. So, let us let us uh, revisit the example that we looked at in the first lecture. So, it is a simple setting that we are looking at. So, you have a graph. Uh, in this case, you have four different values. Uh, like, so, there are four different sensors, each measuring temperature. So, one of them is measure, one of the sensors measures 25 Celsius, 20, 24 and 27. And the goal is to arrive at average consensus. So, average of these sensors, right. And the connectivity that we have is 1 is connected to 2 and vice versa, 2 is connected to all the sensors, 3 is connected to uh, 2, 3, 2 and 4 and 4 is again connected to 2 and 3. 
So that's the connectivity that we have, right? So if I consider this particular adjacency matrix A1 uh, and I run this algorithm, so this is essentially doing A times X and then we are just kind of repeating this over, right? So we see that it eventually arrives at a consensus value, but then it's not the average consensus. The average value is 24, whereas this arrives at something at 23.5 at something, right? And if you look at the matrix A, so is this row stochastic? Yes, right. So it's row, row stochastic. So consensus, I mean, you see the consensus happening, but there is no uh, average consensus. But if I change my A to be, to look something, I mean, which looks something like this now, right. So again, it's row stochastic and it's not just row stochastic, it's something else as well. It's symmetric as well, right. And this also makes it column stochastic. So if I run this with this particular choice of A, you see that uh, eventually they arrive at the consensus value, right? Okay. So which is the average consensus value, which is 24. And so in this lecture, we are going to look at the uh, theory behind it as to why, uh, why W stochastic matrix or the uh, basically guarantees you average consensus. Okay. So the point that we are trying to make here is, uh, so not all A that are row stochastic will lead to average consensus. So it, Basically what do we want? We want that xk plus 1 which is essentially a to the a times xk. So we or another way to write this as a to the k plus 1 times x naught. So we want limit k goes to infinity xk is essentially goes to summation right? this is what we want. Okay. So we want that all agents they converge to this uh, common value. So for this we, we would need a, a little very uh, brief refresher on linear algebra. Okay. So let us briefly revisit linear algebra to be able to understand this in more detail. So everyone here had has had some course on linear algebra. So similarity transformation diagonalizability is that okay with everyone. So we will just quickly recap this. So what is similarity transformation of so if a matrix A, so what do you mean by similarity transformation? So which is So something like this, right? P J P inverse, right? So we say uh, so square matrices. First of all, A and J they need to be square matrices, right? So in fact, P and P and P as well. So A and J are similar if they can be related using this particular transformation. So if J happens to be a diagonal matrix, then we say that A is diagonalizable, okay. We will we'll come to that P part. diagonalize okay so what is what could be a good choice for p and j 
So how do we choose P and J here? Right. So let's say you have, let's say A has a n different eigenvalues eigenvector pairs. Okay. So A is n cross n, and it has these eigenvectors eigenvalue pairs, right? So we know that A v one, for instance, is lambda one v one. A v two is lambda two v two, and so on. And for now, let's just assume that lambda one through lambda n are different. Okay. So I can write this as a times v one if v n okay. And this you can call the J, this is your P and you can write this as P J P inverse. If you have n different eigenvalues and n different eigenvector pairs, they are going to be linearly independent, uh, P inverse exists and therefore you can write A as P J P inverse, okay. So we assume obviously A has distinct Also, let's say simple eigenvalues. Okay. So, fact one. So, we are going to be here. Yeah. So, the fact one is uh, so a real, by the way, when we talk about doubly stochastic, it is going to be a symmetric matrix, right? So, one of the facts is that a real symmetric matrix. as real eigenvalues and is also diagonalizable. Okay. So, when we talk about let us say in something like identity matrix which is let us say 3 by 3 identity matrix. So, what are the eigenvalues of this matrix? So, all all eigen like so eigenvalues are essentially I mean there is just one eigenvalue right, but what are the eigenvectors? So, what is what is the definition of an eigenvector? So, how do we find the eigenvector if you know the eigenvalue? Null space of a minus lambda i right. So, null space of uh, a minus a in this case a is I simply identity. So, identity minus identity right, which is a 0 matrix right. So, essentially in fact these 3 columns are the eigenvectors. So, even though you have one eigenvalue, you have distinct eigenvectors right. So, whereas if you consider an example which looks something like this, let us say 5 this particular matrix 5, 4, 2, 1. 0, 1, 1. So, how do we find the eigenvalues of a matrix? Just set the determinant of A minus lambda, just find the characteristic equation, set it to 0 and it would it turns out that the eigen basically the characteristic equation is given by lambda 1 minus lambda minus 2 lambda minus 4 whole square equal to 0. Now, the repeated eigenvalue is lambda equal to 4 right and it turns out that if I try to find the null space of a minus 4 identity like if I try to find a vector p such that this is equal to 0 unlike in the previous case where I actually get 3 different vectors even with in this case I am going to get just one vector. I mean plus and minus the scale the scaling, but I am going to get just uh, one vector right. So, then what do we do? A square what? So, what is it called? So, let us say I get P. So, P 3 is my uh, P 3 is an eigenvector corresponding to 4 eigenvalue 4. So, then 
what do we do? So, we find P4 such that this is equal to P3. So, this is called generalized eigenvector. Okay. Which is same as I mean if I multiply this by a minus 4 i times identity then this is equal to 0. So, essentially you square it and try to find it. Okay. So, when we try to diagonalize this kind of so first in this case this a is not diagonalizable it is not perfectly diagonalizable, but it is uh, I mean it can be approximately diagonalized using something called Jordan blocks right. Is everyone uh, familiar with Jordan blocks? No? Ok. So, Jordan blocks are the like so essentially in this case j would look something like this. So, for all the eigenvectors for all the simple eigenvalues which have which do not have this multiplicity. So, which in this case are 1 and so you would get something like this, but for the other one I mean technically if the matrix was diagonalizable this is what I mean you would have gotten zeros over here, but you get a 1 here and this is so you get a Jordan block. So, Jordan block j is essentially lambda i. So, in this case it is a 2 by 2 Jordan block lambda i 2 cross 2 plus a nil potent matrix. So, this is this is a Jordan block here. So, if let us say let us say we were talking about 5 by 5 mat dimensional matrix A and let us say 4 was repeated 3 times and still I mean and uh, there was just one distinct eigenvector then that means there are 2 generalized eigenvectors and you would have gotten this to be your Jordan block. Okay. So, again a plus uh, lambda i plus r in uh, the short the nil potent matrix, but the point is if using these p p 1 through p 4. So, if I use p j p inverse with this being your j you can still write a in terms of uh, uh, p like using similarity transformation as p j p inverse where j is not perfectly perfectly diagonal, but approximately diagonal. Okay.